This is Nerdly Out Loud, the official podcast of nerdly.co.uk, your favourite British home for all your news, reviews and interviews and everything else that ends in ooze. That's becoming a bit of a thing. I'm probably going to drop that before the next episode because it does sound terrible. I have an absolutely fantastic interview with the director James Kermack and the lead star of this movie, Mo Dunford, who you might remember from Vikings fame, by the way. Um, yeah, remember him, Aethelwulf? He was kind of like the the King of England sort of uh, second in command, son in law type deal. Yeah, so he's in this. He's absolutely phenomenal in this, by the way. So they came on the show. They they came on the um, the podcast to talk about their new movie, Knuckle Dust, which you can get on VOD and all that good stuff right now. You can actually go out there and you can get it on all the streaming sites, all reputable streaming sites, I might add. Please do support independent film and make sure you watch these movies legally and they get out there for everyone to see. Knuckle Dust is just a bloody, bloody, bloody brilliant thrill ride. I love this movie. It was just incredible. Before we get into it, I will be reading my review from the website, uh, nerdly.co.uk. But before we do all of that, I just want to make you guys aware of a couple of little things. So you all know that if you go to the website nerdly.co.uk, you will see a ton of reviews. I've been churning out quite a few reviews recently. I've been watching a lot. You know, the whole the whole COVID situation, the whole lockdown, the whole furlough. It's got me watching more movies, got me reviewing more movies. Definitely doing wonders for the uh, the podcast and getting fantastic interviews. If you head over to Nerdly UK. Uh, on the YouTubes, that's our YouTube channel, because most of these interviews that you get to hear on these podcasts, there is also a video of the interview on the YouTube. Now, it tends to be a little bit more edited. I like to condense it down for time. So the podcast does usually end up being like the whole chat. Um, Minus a couple of things, because sometimes people, you know, get loose with their lips. So I do take a few things out. But if you go over to Nerdly UK um, on the YouTube and see all our videos on there, there's a fantastic selection of videos. The interview with Mo and James is already up there. It's a great interview. It's going gangbusters as well. It's doing really well. I'm, I'm really happy with that. Um, there's a couple of others. We've got the Liam O'Donnell interview uh, for Skylines. And there's another Skylines video up there, which is a Q&A that I did with the cast and crew. That's right, man. I got to sit down on Zoom. This was this was incredible. I pitched this idea two or three months ago to Vertical Entertainment. They are just some awesome, awesome guys over there. And I basically said to them, I said, look, I want to do like a Zoom room chat. I'm going to sit down, kind of like a Q&A panel, a Comic-Con, whatever, because nobody can do these things. You can't go to a premiere and see this right now. Everything's shut down. It's all on lock. So I was like, let's do a Q&A. Let's get everybody on the on the, on the the panel that we, we can get, you know, if we can make schedules match up and whatnot. And oh my days, did Vertical Entertainment not come back with an absolute screamer? So they got me Liam O'Donnell for the second time. I got to speak to Liam, big fan of Liam anyway, so that was awesome. They got me Lindsay Morgan, who's a, a massive star on the rise. She was in CW Show 100. Um, she was brilliant in that. Uh, she's coming up in Walker Texas Ranger reboot. At least I believe it's the Walker Texas Ranger reboot. It's called Walker. It kind of looks like Walker Texas Ranger. So I'm going to go with that until I'm wrong. So yeah, um, she is in that as well. She is phenomenal and she's amazing. Absolutely amazing in Skylines. Uh, she's brilliant. They also got me Alexander Sadig, who is a name, needs no introduction, absolutely no introduction. He's just awesome. Alexander Sadig, Game of Thrones, DS9, um, pick a franchise, he was probably in it. He's just uh, Peaky Blinders. <laughs> he's, he's just phenomenal. And to round out, we had Mr. Daniel Bernhard, the heir apparent to the Bloodsport throne. I love Daniel Bernhard. He is a man that has been working his socks off over the years. The Matrix. You know, he's he's been he's been kicking ass since day dot. So that that was an awesome thing. So that's on there as well. We got the concrete plans interview um with Mr. Will Jewell. Fantastic interview that I did with the Nelms brothers who made the Mel Gibson film Fat Man. You know, there's there's tons of interviews. Hosts. I did a round table with hosts, that was awesome. There's loads of interviews on there. Please do go and check them out. And there's more stuff going further back. Um, but I'm just here to talk about Nerdly Out Loud's content. 
sorry Phil. So we are going to get into this interview in a minute, but of course you can find us everywhere on iTunes, we are on Stitcher, we are on Podbean, we are on um, iHeartRadio I believe, we're on Google Play, we're on Amazon, we're on, if you go to your Alexa and say play Nerdly Out Loud, you will hear my dulcet tones. Um, we, we're everywhere, man. We're on all these different things. Just look for Nerdly Out Loud. Um, of course, go to your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter. You will find me chatting up a storm about Nerdly Out Loud. Nerdly Out Loud podcast, the official podcast of nerdly.co.uk. So, we are going to get into this episode proper. We're going to get the main featured interview coming up soon. But of course, you guys know that that's not just how I roll. I also like to... Um, do a couple of reviews from the website hence out loud because i read reviews from the website out loud and if i have seen them i will give my opinion on the movies and we're going to start tonight where we're only going to do like maybe two or three probably just the two but we're going to start tonight with the movie that is the featured interview we're going to start with knuckle dust because i saw knuckle dust a wee while ago absolutely just fell in love with the bloody movie I, ju- I just thought the movie was incredible such a good film exactly what was needed in 2020 um so i'm going to read my review from the website and then we will get into the interview proper with mo and james serena marcos a friend of yours do i seem like someone who has a lot of friends to you Oh, gorgeous. On one we ran the door. Three, two, one. You forgot the ram. We didn't bring the ram, ma'am. Mom. <laughs> ram, ma'am. Stop saying frickin' ram. <laughs> Knuckle Dust VOD review by Kevin Halden. That is me. Um, I didn't even introduce myself. Uh, it stars Maud Dunford, Kate Dickey, Geth and Anthony. I've met Kate Dickey, actually. She was awesome. Um, I, I mentioned that in the interview as well. Geth and Anthony, Alex Ferns, who I love. I love Alex Ferns. He's just a man on the rags right now. Uh, Jamie Winstone, Phil Davis, Sebastian Foucault, written and directed by James Kermack. Sebastian Foucault, if you remember um, Casino Royale, you know the scene at the start when he's chasing the guy at the crane, the free runner guy? That is Sebastian Foucault. Absolutely amazing. Um, he's, he's like one of the forefathers of free running. Just, I remember seeing him years and years ago when all that kicked off, and what a guy. What an absolute legend. Okay, so let's get into this. Knuckle dust. I keep saying a lot lately that we are smack dab in the middle of an independent movie surge in the UK with some truly fantastic directors, actors, producers and DOPs all standing up and being counted. Whatever your genre, you can find something for you. From quality horror with the Shudder Lockdown movie Host, straight up sci-fi with Tom Payton's G-Lock, a sports drama with Sam Gittin's Vehicle Break, or martial arts action with Kung Fu Matty's Tribal Get Out Alive. One other independent UK movie that I managed to check out recently that fits the same category is Knuckle Dust. I said that because it was in like um, bold um, text. Honestly, I was intrigued by the cast, the synopsis, and that poster above, which has a real late 90s, early 2000s director DVD vibe to it in all the best possible ways. And being a video shop clerk many moons ago, this only further excited me. Let's dive right into Knuckle Dust, a movie that, as I write this, still has me smiling and thinking about what I just saw. I've got to be honest with you. Um, yeah... This movie still has me smiling to this day. Uh, when did I write this review? This review was written um, back at the start of December, the 2nd of December. I, I'm still smiling about this movie. And then when I got to sit down with the guys, I was smiling even further because I realised how much I truly got this movie. Like, I kind of knew that I got it, but I realised um, James, uh, and uh, J- James in particular, we just had, like, we our minds were a little bit in sync. Like, I kind of got what he was trying to do with this movie, which I think he knew from the start, which is why the boys came on for the interview. And Mo just fucking 100% committed to this role and just absolutely smashes it out the park. Um, but, yeah, I have been saying for a while about uh, independent film. You guys 
who've been listening to this know that I am all about that. I'm all about trying to support the guy, especially the, the likes of... I mean, I named some guys in here that are uh, just unbelievable, you know... Um, Tom Payton for G-Lock, uh, 400 Bullets, coming out next March on Blu-ray and DVD. Can't believe that. That man is just always going to be going places. Sam Gittins was in Break, which was directed by... Oh, shit. I'm going to forget his name. By Michael Elkin. Um, he was He's an awesome dude as well. Uh, Tribal, Kung Fu Matty, Zara Fivian. Go and check out the YouTube. I did an interview with those guys. There is so much fantastic stuff in the UK right now. If you are struggling to find like great independent movies with great independent stories there is something severely wrong and you clearly only check what's trending on netflix because we are in a boom we're in a boom right now and i i can only think that next year off the back of all this bollocks this year next year we're gonna have a good year it's gonna be unbelievable um independent films going far in the uk and of course we invented movies so as it should be let's get back into this Club Knuckle Dust is an elite underground fight club that houses some of the baddest, hardest bastards on the block. Tonight, it is about to be raided by a police special task force. What they find is seven levels of holy hell, full of dead bodies, with only one man still standing, Hard Eight. That's Mo Dumford, with Hard Eight in custody and word that a sinister government sleazy shit official is on his way to take... I didn't actually write that in the review, I just... I just I just set it for Edge, uh, is on his way to take custody of Chief Inspector Catherine Keaton, Kate Dickey, Kate Dickey's awesome, has the runtime of the movie to figure out what the hell went down. Is Hard Eight a bloodthirsty killer or the lone survivor of a massacre? Keaton has 101 questions, but with every answer comes more questions. What the hell happened tonight in Club Knuckle Dust? Three question marks. More Dunford. That's it. That's all I've got. Enjoy the movie. So yeah, um, I got excited. I got excited. This, this guy is just unreal. Seriously. So uh, seriously, Maud Dunford is bloody excellent as Hardy, and is the sheer embodiment of this hyper surreal, almost neo noir action thriller. From the get go, he looks the part. He walks the part, and as the movie goes on, smashes the part. I was a big fan of his role as Ethel Wolf in Vikings, but here he is flexing his acting muscle to the max, fighting, shooting, one-liner dropping and monologuing throughout. This was possibly my favourite leading male performance of 2020. Something I rarely do is sort of like awards and stuff like that. I bet I rarely do like top fives of the year. I'm trying to get back into that with the reviews and everything. Yeah, this this for me still stands i have i've watched a lot of movies this year so i've re reviewed a lot of stuff i've seen a lot of good things personally more dunford wins leading performance of 2020 for me he's the commitment in this movie is unreal and he, he gets it he totally gets it his tongue is th firmly in his cheek the whole way through it it's just great so uh, Knuckle Dust is set in a mega stylized version of real life and James Kermack has crafted a super sexy vision for the screen. What starts out as a bone crunching fight flick quickly turns into an investigative noir with its tongue firmly in its cheek taking itself just seriously enough. And what I mean by that is it skirts the line. There are things in here that could very easily just be so farcical and stupid it would pull you completely out of this world and you'd be done with it very easily. And then there are other, like it could easily go the other way, and and it just becomes too polished and too awesome and too too much. But it dances, it dances there, and it stays there. It it's not too serious, it's not too fun. It's it's knuckle dust. It just sits where it's supposed to. Yeah, I like that. Put that on the poster. It's knuckle dust. <laughs> Drawing on all the best parts of Richie, Rodriguez or Tarantino and slapping a pulpy graphic novel tinge on it, then rounding that out with the killer soundtrack with a touch of sexy synth and a bonkers out there set pieces, making this one of the most internationally British movies I have seen in a while. And what I mean by that is like not just the Brits are going to get this film. Not just the Brits. Everybody could get this film. You could sit down and watch this film and you're going to get something you love. Uh anywhere in the world so that's what i mean by that internationally british just awesome acting all round is spot on with geth and anthony from game of thrones being a scene stealing son of a bitch at every turn looking like he just stepped out of miami vice now there's characters in this there's a lot of characters in this that 
kind of don't feel like they deserve to be in this world or or they should be in this world they don't belong there Gethin and uh, and Anthony is like walking around in a sort of Miami Vice get up he's got the mullet uh, he's an 80s villain he's a quintessential 80s villain and he just plays it so bloody well um, think I think it was Despicable Me 3 uh, Trey Parker played the voice of the baddie check that character out that is what Geth and Anthony's doing throughout this movie and he is awesome so yeah but I, I love this guy he, he pulls off some amazing stuff in this film some some qu- quick one-liners um, him and the character of Not Now Nigel they have some fantastic back and forth the chemistry is brilliant he's just great he's, he's great in the film so I'm, I'm alright with that <clears throat> So let's get back on. Phil Davis, you'll remember Phil Davis, is putting in a turn as an ageing hitman, proving he's still got it. Jamie Winstone. Now, this is a revelation of the movie. Jamie Winston is unbelievable. I loved her in this movie. She's a bright, shining light and brings the Brit brashness. She impressed me here. Sebastian Foucault, the free runner at the start of Casino Royale, is fantastic as TikTok. And this is another character that maybe doesn't belong in this world because he's got this Western vibe and he's walking into this shoot hat and he's dressed up like a cowboy and you just don't know where he's going to go with this character. And they start basically having a bit of a dance fight, which is awesome. And by that, I mean, like, it's, it's more like ballet. The fight is more like ballet. It's just nice, and it flows, and it's beautiful. So, yes, that sounded terrible. So he's fantastic as TikTok and provides one of the fighting highlights of the movie. I am loving seeing Alex Ferns from Chernobyl. Um, he was in um, EastEnders way back. You know, he's like, Mo, eat your gravy. Eat your gravy, Mo. And he was like, battering Mo, and eat your gravy. <laughs> Sorry, I'll never get bored of doing that. <laughs> so he's popping up in loads of stuff lately. I loved him in 2003's Man Dancing. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. 2003, Man Dancing. Go check that movie out. That is a movie, a nice Scottish movie. Go and watch that. Uh, I think it's about time he had his moment. Go watch that film, by the way. Definitely. So this brings me to Kate Dickey. I'm a fan, and she rarely lets me down. We will forgive her for The Last Jedi. That was the movie, not Kate. So she's sharing equal billing with Dunford. She lights up the interrogation room with some great dialogue and chemistry between the two is on point. I think James Kermack has done something special here and has a cracking cast that know what this movie is and what it wants to be. The fight choreography is a country mile better than what I was expecting with an emphasis on the film's elevator fight, which is fantastic, which was frantically brutal, and the gimp suit clad ninjas in the corridor that was gleefully reminiscent of that old boy hallway fight. You know which one. So you replace the hammer with a dildo. Yes, there are many dildos in this movie, and some of them are nunchuck dildos, because that's what you get in Club Knuckle Dust. Um, Only replace the hammer with a dildo. The visual even turning to a side view... Yeah, yeah, it does that. So you know how, like, in the the movie, it kind of goes to a side view, and then it's all good? So they do that, um, which, which A, took me by surprise, and B, looked great. From the first frame to the last, Knuckle Dust knows itself and in turn knows the audience, which is me. That is exactly me. I love just about everything they threw at us. Intelligent one-liners and a complex script with a well-told narrative, bursts of neon, splatterings of blood, flashes of guns, and even inserting some animation in there to further conjure up that graphic novel comic book feel. I can't recommend Knuckle Dust enough. It's an entertaining, balls to the wall, funny as hell, superb way to spend 105 minutes. Give me a sequel, James Kermack. I have my eyes on you. So yeah, um, I gave this 5 out of 5, as you're probably going to guess. There's no way I couldn't. Knuckle Dust is released on VOD in the UK on December the 11th, 2020. So you can go and get it now. Please do go and get it. VOD, all streaming sites, check this film out. What we're going to do is we're going to move straight into the interview. Knuckle Dust, interview with Mo Dunford, James Kermack. Take it away. I loved speaking to these guys. And now, our feature presentation. I am absolutely, absolutely ecstatic to be getting this one. I've, I've had a bit of a week. I've had a bit of a month. I've had a bit of a year, to be honest. I think we all have. But um, a movie came along um, that showed me 
2020 and COVID-19 will not steal everything from us. We can still have awesome movies. We can still be entertained. Knuckle Dust came round and oh my days. So if you're going to have a movie that throws everything, including the kitchen sink at you, this is the one that does it. Tonight I have got James Kermack, the director of the movie, and Mo Dunford, who you may recognize from Vikings, by the way, joining me on the Zoom to talk about Knuckle Dust. How are you lads tonight? Good, man. Good. Hey, Kev. This is awesome, guys. This is awesome. Uh, James, we spoke about this a little while back, but Mo just pretty much hijacked my Twitter DMs and says, Luke, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do to me on set. You tweet yeah. me. And go, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm like, you're in the room, man. Just just say it. It's fine. He loves his Twitter. <laughs> someone someone told me about Knuckle Dust, and I actually had to get on to James to say, James, give me a part in this, will you? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 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 just do the lead. Do the lead. It's fine. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. That was okay. it. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll do the lead. Okay. We did two two DMs in Twitter, and that was it. It was on stage. <laughs> Surely that's how it works these days. That's that's exactly how it should be done. <laughs> none, none of this self taping. Just just DM each other. I'll yeah. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to get into that in a second, but I I genuinely am thrilled to be speaking to you guys because this is a movie. This is a movie that it took me it took me by surprise. I I sat down and I've said this to you, James. Like I I used to work in a video shop and I used to love my straight to DVD films and all that. You always found yourself a little gem, and of course, it's a little bit different now with, with streaming platforms and whatnot. But I saw the poster for Knuckle Dust, and I just thought, and by the way quick one the new poster oh my days that is a sexy poster yeah. that is an awesome poster very struzan as you said yes. but um i saw the original poster and i just thought oh man that just looks fun that just looks fun and i put it on and what i got was a, a call back to the late 90s early 2000s just everything i used to love about movies just tickling my bone so <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you man like you, you know you make these films and you kind of like uh especially a film that's as out there uh as this is and your reaction was you know the reaction you want to hear not just like uh it, it came across as a well-written review from a, a film journalist but it came across as someone who you imagine sitting in the audience in the cinema and they got it and you were just like that's it that's the reaction that's exactly why you know we spent this time making this film so thank you man it really it it, it gave me a lot of heart it was great. Awesome, man. I've, I'll be honest with you, I've not been called a film journalist. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the, like, every now and then when I do put a review out, I do, I'll get, like, a, a cheeky little message on Twitter or something like that. And I got your message, and then I got Mo's message as well, sort of just messaging me, kind of saying, thanks for getting the movie and all that kind of thing. And I was just like, how can you not? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> we, me and James want to talk to someone who's film literate, who gets movies, who knows the effort that, that, that is required to into, put into a movie like this. And you got it. So we, that's why we want to talk to you, because you awesome. love your film and there's other people out there who, who love it as much as you do, you know? Oh, there are, there are. I've seen the reviews coming through and I'm, I'm thrilled to see that there are other people getting it, but let's just remember I got there first, lads. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, back when you were our only lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, we got one. James, please, let's get on to him. Do I do it? Do you do it? Shut it down. Stick with this one. Everyone yeah. put it down. We're done. Just use uh, uh, yeah, you know when you say something and you instantly play it back in your head? Yeah, that was that. That was that moment. <laughs> <laughs> you guys make my job a little bit easier. And the listeners out there, the viewers out there, because obviously this will be on YouTube as well, let them know exactly who you guys are, how you, you came into this mad, wonderful industry, and more importantly, how the two of you ended up on Knuckle Dust together. Bit of a loaded question, but... <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll try it. <laughs> uh, Mo, do you want to go first? Well, James's interpretation of me is, hello, I'm Mo Dunford, and I'm from Ireland. Hello there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've, I've always liked the same sort of movies and visual styles that James liked, and um, I've been acting for maybe 10 years now. And a friend of mine, Amy Bailey, while I was rehearsing this little fight teaser in Ireland, video, FaceTime me, 
and said, I have a good friend of mine called James Carmack who uh, wants to make an action movie. Are you, are you up for it? So I read the script and I read it and I was like, Jesus, this is ambitious. Whoa, where is this going? There's layers upon layers of what's going on. Whoa, who is this? Who is this character? This is a challenge. Oh, he wants to put fights here, there. I was like, let me talk to the man. And then uh, I met James in London. And we bonded over Charles Bukowski. Uh, that's it, game over, game okay. over. We were done. And we bonded, <laughs> you know, and uh, I looked up James and I looked up his his, his movie, High Low Joe, which de dealt with mental health. And uh, that was a very brave film. And what what really got me in, in was meeting James himself and seeing how James spoke about the experience, the cast from High Low Joe, the crew, how he was interviewed, how he spoke about them, how loyal he was, how brave he was to get this movie over the line. And I just said, that's a man I want to work with. This is incredibly ambitious. This this uh, cerebral thriller, half action movie, Kung Fu. He's got Pete Pedrero doing the fights, but he's also got a sort of usual suspects vibe. And how do you get the audience on the side of this character called Hard Eight when all this crazy stuff is happening around him? So. Meeting James and, 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 you know, flowing from and vibing off of him, I, I just thought I have to do it. It's a challenge. And also, this is the guy I want to work with because he seems very patient. He's, he knows exactly what he wants. He's a, he's a visionary. We love the same movies. I was in. I was in. And I'm from Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you cast Mo Dunford, for anyone who wants to know. Uh, it's that simple. James, you, you, you're the writer director on this, and and as Mo keeps on saying, and Mo's said, and, I, and I've said a few times, it, it's a it's a nuts movie. Um, where, where where did Knuckle Dust come from, and and what exactly were you taking when you wrote it? <laughs> I, I, I've done a lot of drugs. Uh, <laughs> the last decade of working on this film. Um, yeah, it came from originally. Uh, I was I started out as an actor. Uh, in theatre and then moved into film and TV and it started out as a vehicle for myself so I tried to write something for myself uh, to be in um, and uh, it developed from there and I got a few good meetings and I got some really good advice um, from a guy called Rob Mitchell uh, who, who passed uh, recently very sadly he's a really good guy in the business and basically sat me down bought me a few beers and a couple of wines and kind of said I love this script it's one of the best scripts I've ever had it's mental uh, it's amazing you can't play the lead but it's amazing um, and, uh, and I was kind of like you know Jesus Christ I've spent all this time working on this script you know trying to write something for myself expecting some kind of uh, Rocky Stallone kind of uh, adventure mm. to write a biography about in many years uh, when I'm doing, you know, Knuckle Dust 18 uh, with a, you know, 80 year old, 90 year old cast. But uh, he basically gave me the advice, write yourself a uh, supporting role, get a really good lead actor uh, and a cast around you uh, and then go from there. And I was a bit upset at the time, but I thought, you know what, that's a good idea. I'm going to uh, uh, really push on this and take more creative control. So I decided, you know, what, I'm going to direct it. Um, this was after we went through uh, talking to quite a few directors, uh, one of whom, for instance, was Tony Kay, who did American History X. Um, amazing director. Uh, he was really interested in doing it, uh, shooting it out in L.A. And um, at the time, I was still attached as the, the actor. So I did a self-tape for myself, bloodied up myself and, you know, uh, uh, shot something I thought looked really cool. Uh, and he hadn't watched it yet. So we were actually Zooming whilst he was in L.A., pre-Zoom. I think Skype, and uh, he said, "Oh, you know, I'm just going to look at this, uh, look at this self tape." Then, so he's watching the self tape for the first time while I'm watching him watch the self tape. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Jesus!" And he was going, "I was like, am I about to lose a job that I've given myself while <laughs> I'm watching it, doing a bad audition?" Uh, and I was like, "Jesus Christ!" It was the most nerve wracking thing. And then, uh, and he basically said, "Yeah, you know what? I can work with you. Let's do this." Um, so I was like, fantastic. And then that sadly didn't work out. And so I ended up taking the reins myself. Um, but much as uh, no one would hire me to play the lead in it, um, no one was going to hire me to direct it. So, um, cause it was too mad and too big. And so I decided to go direct Hilo, uh, which was something much smaller, uh, more dramatic, not action based, um, to prove that I could direct a feature film and handle it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that came out 
Uh, and then people uh, were kind of like, well, you obviously can't jump from this drama to an action film. That makes no sense. So uh, it was kind of like, right, OK, but I've already done the feature now to prove that I could do a feature. Right, let's start again. Uh, so we just started again and went from there, really. And so it's just been um, five years uh, with my current producer, Julien, who's fantastic, um, pushing uh, for the film and then finally got it over the line. So it's been like a 10 year, 10 year journey, I think. Um, it, it's been long, but uh, I mean, it's finally over the line. It's there and, uh, and we're here chatting about it now. So it's fantastic. <laughs> we, finished, we finished filming uh, like this time last year, you know, so it was a year ago. Mm. We had no idea that the whole year would happen. I mean, you talk about how yeah. crazy the script is, but we haven't spoken about how crazy this year is. So, <laughs> the, script, the script is a normal day life compared to, you know, the crazy <laughs> year we've had. So, you know, it's completely normal. 2020 does smack of... Well, this uh, is the new, it's the new kitchen sink drama of the future, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you know, that's what I, that's what I mean, that's right. James made me to believe when I signed up to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's nil by mouth with dildos. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, I was just, took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the words. So you said before that um, I worked in the video store, so I saw all those movies. And was was there any sort of movies from, and you said that you've worked in the video store as well. So, like, was there any movies back then that you sort of drew on and you were, like, inspired by when writing this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I found an old script, my first ever script uh, when we were moving house recently. And um, I must have been 15, 16 when I was writing it. Um, and there are character names in it from Nuff With Us Now and uh, a lot of twists and stuff. Um, and I think I, was, I, I just watched Usual Suspects, uh, which mm. is obviously a huge influence on the film. Um, but like 90s wise, I mean, it's, it, it gets a lot of... Um, uh, people say Guy Ritchie quite a lot and, and stuff like that. But uh, many of the influences actually were a lot earlier. So it was more 70s, 80s. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at more, you know, the John Carpenter kind of vibe. And um, for like the visuals, one of my favourite films is Streets of Fire. Have you ever seen that? A Walter Hill film. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like part musical, part action. Uh, it's set in kind of like this nowhere time where it mixes with the 50s and the 80s. Um, and that's a, a really big influence on Knuckle Dust because that's kind of what we tried to push for, where the costumes and the production design has a kind of otherworldliness to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, Streets of Fire, John Carpenter stuff. And uh, and obviously, yeah, there's the Tarantino, Guy Ritchie, Usual Suspects kind of 90s element to it. It's one of those things that when I was when I was writing the review, and I, and I even put that in there about um, the Tarantino and the Rodriguez, the Guy Ritchie and everything. It's just such an easy thing to go to, but... When you're saying about like the the John Carpenter side of things, you're completely right. And something that springs to mind with that is like the way he uses music as well. Like his music doesn't always match up with your genre kind of thing. And here you have um, the thing that springs to mind right now is the fight with TikTok. Yes. Like the music comes on and it's it's like you're watching a western, but you're about to watch two guys just start smacking crap out of each other. You know, it's yes. Walter Mayer's composition for this is awesome. I, I saw it last week. It's uh, unreal. Walter Mayer's one. him together with uh, is Natasha the editor. Uh, uh, what the editor? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Natasha. Nat Natasha, Natasha. Well, when the two of them together, you see it. It's 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 amazing how they work together and reflect James's script. But also the, with the the scores, it's like I saw. Uh, you love the Great Escape. I thought there's a little bit of Great Escape whenever Hooper comes on, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a there's a lot in there. If you if you're a, if you're a true movie fan, you'll you'll catch a lot of the little. And uh, I, I mean, even one. it was Great Escape. <laughs> <laughs> I even like the the cheeky little jibe when uh, when Hard Eight first comes to his first battle, his first fight, and it uh, kind of kicks off the whole movie, which I am assuming is an Indiana Jones little little moment. Yeah, there's a little nod. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just you, you pick up on all these things. It's just such a fantastic way you've done it. But the score, I I love the movie as is, but the score very much elevates certain scenes, and and that's it, one of them that I picked up on. I loved. It really does. I mean, Walter did a, a a fantastic job. Also, you know, kind of like much like every every HOD when I kind of ask or an or the actors when I ask for something, and they're like, okay, okay, let's let's go with that. Mm. Um, I mean, I had a playlist for. Uh, Walter, I mean, I had a playlist for two years, um, which I'd worked on. I'd been adding on to each time. And I came in with a full playlist uh, with, you know, a couple of tracks for each moment. 
Um, and Walter's like, fantastic. Um, you know, we got to work on a really big uh, Morricone uh, mm. style track for the big uh, action finale, which we're super happy about because we're both really big Morricone fans. Um, and there were lots of nice little carpenter touches, uh, um, Untouchables, uh, Great Escape, of course. Um, there was a lot of different stuff in there where we were kind of like, okay, let's have a little play and let's see, you know, who... I mean, it's a film for film fans. You, you yeah. know, it is a movie, but it's a film for film fans. And I'm a huge, huge film fan. And so there are lots of little nods in there for kind of everyone. I think. It shows. It shows. It absolutely shows on screen. When you um, when you have your script ready and, and you're happy with it and everything, we've we figured out how sort of more came on in the movie and everything, but you have got a fantastic, eclectic cast of people in here, like people that you, you possibly haven't seen for a little while, people who are on the up, people who are very much just in, in the, the limelight right now, just a fantastic little cast that you've got. How did you go about getting these people? And was a sort of, you had them in mind when you were writing it or was it like, let's see who we can get? Um, it was kind of, I kind of <laughs> picked them up as I've gone along and then really held tightly onto them, um, <laughs> and going back to them. And so, you know, with like casting, it was kind of, again, I knew I really wanted to direct a huge ensemble and um, it goes back to like The Great Escape again, uh, or, or, you know, like um, Towering Inferno, or again, it's the 70s and the 80s, you know, and, uh, and those kind of casts where you'd see the names in squares, or you'd see the Drew Struzan kind of poster, which we, we just put out. Um, and I really wanted to do that, where it's that kind of big eclectic cast, and you go, I know them from this, and I love them in this. Uh, so it's something for everyone. And so basically, yeah, I just picked them up as I've gone along, like Gethin Anthony, who plays Jeremiah. Um, I've known him for over a decade. We did theatre together. Uh, he's one of my best pals. Um, so I've kept him there for a very long time. He was one of the first to come <laughs> on board. Um, Kate Dickey and Phil Davis came because um, we premiered my first feature at the Denard Film Festival in France. And uh, I was one of the judges on a short film panel. Uh, I met Kate, uh, met Phil, and I knew I was like, God, I've got to ask them if they want to read Knuckle Dust. Um, you know, had a beer with them after all the judging had been done, so there was no you know, witness. And, <laughs> and, uh, hey, uh, do you want to be in my film? I'm just film. Uh, I can picture it. <laughs> pro quo, guys. Um, so that was all out of the way, but basically, you know, kind of said to them how much I love their work. And, you know, with Phil Davis, I basically said to him, look, do you want to read this script? And he was like, I'd love to read the script. Fantastic. And I was like, great. I'm going to tell you now for 30 minutes how good I think you are and how brilliant you are in Face, which is one of my favourite films. Yeah. Um, and then I'm never going to do it again, I promise, and I'll be super professional. And he was like, <laughs> okay. And I was like, you're brilliant in Face. It's so good. The bit with Ray Winston and all this. Um, and he's been super awesome. So he stayed, and Kate stayed for like three years, you know, four years waiting on the project. Um, constantly, you know, every one, once a year getting back and just, hey, how's it going with Knuckle Dust? And, you know, mm. that mad little script. Um, and that's kind of how I went about the whole thing. Alex Ferns, I met. Oh, man. He, he's amazing. And uh, unreal. It, yeah. he's just phenomenal. And it, we've got a mutual friend, Mo and Alex, Eugene O'Hare, who's a, yeah. a, an absolutely fantastic writer uh, and um, actor in his own right. Oh, he's just yeah. one of the best writers yeah. ever. Um, and uh, I went to see him and Alex Ferns in True West, the Sam Shepard play at the Tricycle a couple of years ago. Mm. Phenomenal play. And, and they were just unbelievable. And then I turned up on the set of, at the airport for the set of Chernobyl, the HBO show. And um, all my scenes were with Alex. Nice. Um, oh. And so we had to get naked together. <laughs> and so we bonded over penis size, uh, which, uh, funnily enough, he did a whole article uh, in the, May I think, Scottish <laughs> Mail or something uh, about talking about penis size with another actor and I was like I'm in the photo <laughs> so um, basically yeah and I was like you know do you want to read this script and he was like yeah of course he's an, an absolute legend and then we got him literally just before you know uh Batman and Star Wars and uh the new guy Rich he's done the new guy Rich yeah. Jason Statham cash truck um so you know his career's just like whew, gone amazing so we're really lucky to have just you know just picked him up as we did I don't think we, we just couldn't book him now uh <laughs> He's too big. He's godfather to my daughter, but, you know, he's, he's, he's massive. It's true. Um, it's true. So, yeah, and that's how we kind of picked everyone up. Amy Bailey has been a friend of mine for a really long time. You know, she she read the script in a Costa about seven years ago um, when I couldn't afford coffee in the Costa. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's just kind of Bro, picked up that how, way. How did you get Sebastian? Uh, so Sebastian came on board uh, for a good pal of mine who I 
met through Amy uh, called Tony Webb, really lovely guy. Um, and he set up the meeting and Seb walked in. I mean, I'm a huge Sebastian fan. Uh, I saw Casino Royale at the cast and crew um, when it came out in town. And it just like, I hadn't seen a Bond film in a long time, which I loved. Mm. And it just blew me away. I thought it was so good. And um, Seb's amazing. And as soon as you meet him, he's so chill and his, his energy and his positivity and his heart is just there mm -hmm. and it warms the whole room. Yes. And then we just talked about how I wanted to do the fight sequences, each sequence as a musical theater number, like a musical mm -hmm. number. And I see everything with the music and um, we discussed singing in the rain, which we both love. Um, and I said, that's exactly how I'd like to do, you know, the TikTok fight is mm -hmm. it's a musical number. So let's really look at that, that feel the beat. Um, and that's what he is, he is, he moves musically. It's fantastic. So uh, that's how Seb came on board. So I was, I was very chuffed with that because he's brilliant in the film. He is great, and he's he's kind of the 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 forefather of free running as well from back in the day. And and yeah. as you say, Casino Royale, um, it, 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 we had a new Bond coming out. They said it was going to be fresh. It was going to be re revitalized. And and here's Sebastian, free running over bloody cranes and Crane. stuff and you're like yeah. and you're, you're sitting there thinking yeah this is a new bond yeah, yeah, yeah. i haven't seen this i thought you more did never, this oh i've never seen anything like that in my life yeah. none of us have ever seen an action scene like that in our lives the chase scene in our lives like you go who is that guy <laughs> that's another story about how i first met sebastian jesus i met him on my first day of rehearsals for the fights and they said, right, we've booked you a train out to Bedford because for whatever reasons, we can't do the rehearsals in London. I was like, what, Bedford? Really? You couldn't bring me all the way to Bedford? No way am I going to Bedford and back every day. I was like, get me out to Bedford. Well, I went out to Bedford anyway. I stayed there for three nights. They open up this shed door We when we find the place. And there's Sebastian with his Bruce Lee T-shirt on. And nice. Peter Pedrero is there. And Sebastian is there working through his beats. He's talking. I, I remember him going, he's like, I wanted to be like singing in the rain. You know what I mean? I go, oh, shit, what have I got myself into? I'm nervous. And Sebastian is there like, let's begin. And I just, he's amazing, man. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Amazing. Combat in this flick, I, I'm just I, I loved a big fan of. I, I love a good punchy kicky movie. You, you can give me all the dialogue in the world, but as long as you're giving me some punchy kicky stuff, I'm also really happy as well. And you guys had an incredible team behind this, and I saw there was, there was numerous guys, including uh, Mr. Neil uh, Chapel now Chapel Hill. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, who um, he, he needs no introduction. I've I've seen a ton of things that he's worked on, and I've spoken to a ton of people who have worked with him. Yes. What, what was it like for you guys um, do, doing the fight choreography, James yourself directing it, but also Mo getting to do all the punches and kicks? And because who doesn't love just having a good fight? <laughs> Mo, well, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean. As I said earlier, a big part of this was working with James, working with him as a director, mm. seeing what he wanted. And the, the other half then is what he had written into the fights and saying, right, we've got Pete Pedrero here. We've got his team. We've got Sebastian Foucault. We've got Olivia Richters. We've got all these amazing people. We've got Guillaume Delaney, Delaney. And um, that was really exciting for me to work with a team because, yes, I've done Vikings and I've worked with good mm. swordsmen and Richard Ryan and these great stuntmen. But I never did something that was as visceral and as out there as this, but it was just working with the team, man, and how to tell a story, how to tell a narrative and how to make the punches count where the audiences feel it. And, and mm. James always said, you know, we don't want to make this look choreographed. We want to make this look like it's happening right now. We want to make this look like it's just made up on the spot. So when you're dealing with Sebastian, I think working with those guys and Peter's excitement, it was a joy. Those first three days were like, if you're lucky as an actor, you get to maybe rehearse and talk to the director and build up a rapport, which me and James had. But as well as that, James is like, right, buddy, you're going out to Bedford. And I'm like, all right, have, have a good time. But it also, because we're like five days away from shooting the thing, it gave us a real groundedness because yeah. there was something in going over the, and the repetition of the movements of going, each time we do this and each time we get better, by the time you come to shoot, by the time you shoot with, with, with Kate as Keaton, 
you will already feel like you've achieved something, you know? So, so, you know, I, I am, I guess what I'm trying to say is I remember there was this one day where I was, I, I really look up to Sebastian, you know, my son is doing parkour right now, you know, parkour, you know, off steps and things, you know, <laughs> he thought it was cool that I worked with Sebastian. And yeah, definitely. I remember there was one day, you know, actors being actors are silly, but I trying to break the ice, whatever. I said, yo, they're making a new matrix. You know, Sebastian, you, you would be great in this. He kind of looked at me, he's like, why, why would I do that? I said, we got your action and you do all of that and it's happening. And it's kind of, why would I want to do this? I said, I don't know. He said, I said, I've tried Casino Royale came out. I've done this, I've done movies here. I've worked here, I've worked there. I mean, the acting coaching, I went to lessons, I've done Hollywood movies. But I've been in the cafeteria and I've seen people look down their nose at the water dispenser, the coffee machine, treating people like they're lower than them. Why do I want to be involved in movies? I don't want to be a part of that scene. I don't want to be involved in that scene. He says, I'm interested in this. I said, what is this? And he goes, I'm interested in this. This is this. And I said, well, what is this? I said, this <laughs> is this in the moment, trying to overcome, looking the other person in the eye, right here, right now, looking over in the moment, take by take, trying to overcome the next thing. It's me and you, we're in it together. We'll carry it for the rest of our lives. There's no past, there's no future, just now. And I'm like, I want someone to watch her have them, man. <laughs> I want someone to watch her have them. I, Because it's like, when you're doing the scenes then, and when you're doing knuckle dust, you don't worry about what's happening next. You don't worry about what you've done. You're worried about, you're, you're focused on James's vision here and now, making sense of this, this, this world, this world building which James has created, making sense of TikTok and the costumes and staying grounded. And the, the fights beforehand, training for the fights were so good because it grounded the character of, Brody and working with Sebastian. Oh man, talking about the the larger than life characters that exist within James's script. I mean, yes, that's essential. But the larger than life characters who I met on the job. You talk Jamie Winstone, badass. What you see is what you get. She is just awesome, awesome. You look at her and go, fucking cast her and everything. <laughs> uh, you know, seriously, she's amazing. Oh, amazing, uh, Guillaume. As Tombstone, you could have cast, and, and I know you talked about this, and it's another conversation about casting, but he has such a, a strength, but such a, a vulnerability to him. I'd, I, I want to work with him for the rest of my life. Sebastian, all of these interesting characters. Alex Ferns, who is now a really close friend of mine, larger than life characters. So working with Peter Pedrero and that really informed the characters and how to bring it into to with Kate scenes and the I felt ready to do that full week with the interrogation with 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 Kate Dickey and I mean what can I say I was I was spoiled man it's like she's a mm. guardian angel who looks after you in that scene we did a full week week and a half together it was just day in day out and interrogation heavy stuff a lot of lines and just she's the most humane generous actor I was just spoiled she's I love her to bits so it was a joy, man, you know? <laughs> what can I say? On, on the back of what Mo just said, uh, two things. Um, so Guy, firstly, Guillaume, uh, I think he plays obviously a lot of, uh, like he played uh, Frankenstein's monster, and Victor Frankenstein and stuff, you know? And I think one of the things, because of his size, um, one of the things that gets missed with him is his soul and heart. He mm. has so much heart and he's a... He, he's just got so much radiating out of him. He's a really good person. And it's one of the reasons I really love him in the role, because when you look in his eyes, there's so much going on. And I think some, some people have probably just looked at his size and his build and gone, that's, that's what that is. Whereas, in fact, there's so much going on. He is a fantastic actor, a really skilled, brilliant actor. And I really hope that he gets more acting roles out of this, because... He, not only did he use his size, he then didn't speak and only did sign language to communicate. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hell of a role for him and, it, and he delivered it really, really well. Um, and then with regards to the, the stunts and the fights, which I'm really glad you liked, and, and obviously a lot of the feedback is coming back that, that the fights are fantastic and that they really stand out, which I'm very happy about. I think Pete and his team did a fantastic job. And from the very beginning, me and Pete 
had that discussion because I really didn't want um, slick uh, John Wick, you know, style fights. Um, I wanted something where it felt like uh, the chat was that whatever hard eight Brody kind of walked into, he had to kind of change tact and go with it. So people didn't, because you see in a lot of these films, I find that the bad guys tend to kind of adapt to the good guy. So uh, the bad guys adapt to kind of John Wick and you have this fighting style that happens throughout the film. Whereas what I really wanted was a slightly scrappier, uh, grungier kind of fighting where it looks painful, it looks in the moment and it looks less coordinated. Um, so you have those kind of moments during the, the dildo fight where, you know, um, Mo breaks um, <laughs> during sorry, the- sorry, something, sorry. Go on. Please, don't worry. Imagine pitching this every time. Uh, I'm amazed we got funded. And uh, the bit where Mo uh, cracks someone's leg open and the camera flips and it just kind of feels like, yeah, th this is just happening in the moment, right? This, they've just got one camera and just filmed it. I mean, this looks insane. Um, so Pete and his team did an absolutely fantastic job. They were, they were really good on set and they, and they really really nailed what I asked for, which I really appreciate, as did every HOD. Everyone did exactly what I tried to achieve with the vision and with the script. So I was really appreciative of that across the board. And as well as that, just to add, because I know I went into other territory there, but about the fights, uh, Peter, Neil, Miguel, who I've just seen an officer down, by the way, that, that Neil did. It was fantastic, mm -hmm. the action thing. I know you reviewed it the other day. It was well. great, great shot, great shot. Really great piece. You know, Peter saw me walking in from the taxi after I got lost like a rabbit in the headlights or whatever. And he goes, right, this guy isn't, what, what, what's the name of the guy, Scott Adkins, or these guys who, you know, they look like they could take care of you. We have Brody who describes how he kicked ass in the club. Mm -hmm. But in the flashbacks, we have the realization, actually, Brody's getting his ass kicked. And mm -hmm. Peter was like, yeah, you're that guy, you know? So, <laughs> so he was like, as opposed to, uh, we talked a lot about Harrison Ford. We talked a lot about how he just scrapes by by the end of it. And I chatted a lot to James about that. And we all found that, right, there's this Brody character who's telling the tale. But in reality, there's this other comedic part that you're just getting by by the skin of your teeth. Because I, I love seeing that. And Peter was able to implement that in a way that made it visceral, made it exciting, made it just when he's about to get, he gets a fire extinguisher. And, ah, you know what I mean? So I, I love that because it, you know, and Sebastian was all into that because it's the Fred Astaire or whatever. It's it, yeah. it, it was so much it's fun. Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the thing is as well, you have to have that. Uh, it, for this to work, the way the, the structure of the film works, we, you know, Brody's being interrogated, we're flashbacking to the fights. Yeah. If he looks like he's going to just steam through every fight, then no fights have any uh, point. Um, because he, you, even though you know as an audience member, he's alive and he's talking right now, in each fight, you have to feel like he might not make this, even though you know. Um, I, I, so love, I, that's I, love that, um, I love that moment as well, when it's so fantastic. It's such a, You have amazing little character beats in this movie, and I want to talk about a couple of them. But when you have um, the, the tech guy sort of sitting there watching the fight, and then he turns around and goes, I wonder if he'll survive. I absolutely love that moment, because you're just sitting there thinking, what? And then, <laughs> and then you get Jamie Winston sort of looking at him thinking, what? <laughs> just just little character moments like that. It's if just... anyone's going to make you feel like a dope Jamie Winston. <laughs> looking at you. You yeah. feel a chain. Yeah. <laughs> He's done a really good job. Obviously, it's his first feature, uh, Dave Bibby. Yeah. Um, who's uh, he's a stand-up comedian. Um, but his, uh, he did self-tapes for the film and they were so good. Um, and he really made the effort on them and he shot them, you know, he shot the scenes in the car for, and he shot the stuff at the computer and he did it, shot it like we're on a Zoom now. So he was like that, you know, doing his monologue. Um, mm -hmm. He did a great job, I think, Bibi, you know, surrounded by really established, really experienced actors. And I think he really stepped up. Um, so I'm really glad you love those little touches from him because he delivered them so well. Oh, he does, and and there's there's a lot more of them. Um, touching on um, Tombstone, there you're talking about the 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 fact that he's not talking much and he's doing the sign language. One of my favourite moments in the movie is actually the moment between Mo and and him when you're sign languaging together. But Mo, it's your it's your little laugh when he says about not having to listen to them and all this. Your little laugh there. It's one of those moments that sells your character 
but also helps to sell his character as well. So then when you get to the the elevator fight, you just you you're all in, you're in for the ride. It's interesting, man. It's interesting. James James's brain <laughs> James's brain is interesting. No, <laughs> when, you, when you read the script and you go you know, because you have your fights, but then you also have your three weeks prep in sign language, you know. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> but when you read it, you don't know uh, how something like that would connect. But I genuinely do feel like there's a, there's a thing about Brody and the character of Brody. You go, well, well what is this guy doing it for? Well, there's a, an upper class, there's an upper eclan, and they are spitting and looking down on this other class, these homeless vets, these downtrodden people and people like uh, Guillaume's character, Tombstone's character. And, and there's just something about the vulnerability of Guillaume that when he does this with his hands, I, I couldn't not but laugh. You know what I mean? I'm like my brother, you know what I mean? He's beautiful. He's beautiful. But uh, I like the switches in the characters. You know, I love yeah. when, when, when Dave turns from his comedic self, to to an, an, another an, a, a, another layer shows and I, I love um, I love what he did there I love how he could be comedic and really grounded and I love uh, without giving anything away <laughs> <laughs> so difficult to talk about the film but one scene without spoiling anything that I do I do want to talk about and you kind of you kind of glossed over it before a little bit and it's um, how how exactly do you approach a gimp wearing dildo throwing fight sequence in that hallway because I was I was just trying to like tell someone about this movie and and I I came to that scene and I was like you just have to watch it for this one scene and they're like why so I explain kind of what's going on and I'm like but it looks like it's an old boy and yeah. and who doesn't like that scene in old boy you know who doesn't like the hallway scene in Daredevil but think of that in gimp suits. <laughs> when you, when you wrote that, how did you actually approach filming it? When you it's it? a really good question. How do you approach it? Because <laughs> it's something that I would think no. that when I wrote it, oh yeah, that looks badass. That's going to be amazing. But then when you come and film it, it's like, what the? F what was I thinking when I wrote this? <laughs> I don't know. You know what? I'm going to have to go back through the drafts and see when that was added in, and then look back <laughs> maybe from my phone or or you know my Facebook or whatever, and and, and see what I was up to at the time, um, or what, again what I was on. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's obviously inspired. There is inspiration there from Old Boy. I mean, it, fights in corridors are great because they're such tight spaces. Um, so you you know the idea as well is to um, as the film goes, is to go from that massive opening arena fight, yeah. and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller every time um, he moves uh, down the floors. Each fight gets into a smaller space. So you know we go from from that um, the big space, and then we're in. Um, uh the the corridor i think um and then we go to the elevator and you know it gets smaller and smaller each time um to make it more impactful but yeah i don't know where it came from i just had the idea of like what the idea was what haven't i seen on screen before <laughs> and um obviously the other thing was it's a it's a club for elite people so what do you have there you have uh the killing of the poor you have drugs and you have sex and I was just kind of like, okay, so what do we do with the sex? Um, and then it came with the s and and I was kind of like, okay, what do they fight with? Because the idea was, if they're in an s and room, what do you pick up? It's that born identity kind of thing, you know, he uses what's in the room. Um, so there's a kind of inspiration there when he picks up the, the pen or the pencil or the newspaper or the magazine. So it's like, well, we have dildos. Um, but would they be prepared for certain fights if they're also badasses? So they'd probably have dildo nunchucks. Yes, like, so let's go with dildo nunchucks. Um, and so it just came from there. Like, what haven't I seen before? And uh, uh, I've never seen that in Ireland. I tell you that. <laughs> Sign me up. No. <laughs> when you've written it, and and there's a lot of scenes in this that because it is a it's a hyper hyper realistic movie. You know, it's it's set in a world that isn't of this one, and it's kind of just like. What was the? How important was it for you to not go too far 
that way or not go too far this way because there's a lot of scenarios in this film and a lot of characters in this film it could very easily have become just a straight up farce you know and and this movie knows exactly what it is and where it needs to be but how important was it to skirt that lane for you it was tough i mean like you know really gone all out on the film to try and make something that i haven't seen before yeah which means you cross genreing quite a lot um and really you know usually with these kind of films with the tone of the comedy you won't go as serious as we go um so the kate dickey and uh, mo dumford scenes um mo um mm-hmm. those scenes in the interrogation are they get real deep they get real serious um and then it cuts back and forth between you know mo walking into a room with uh two uh you know geezers with strap ons you know it's um it, it, it's a juxtaposition uh, that you have to get used to, but um, it was fun to try and to try and get that done. You know, it's fun to try and really push against the genres, see where they merge, see where they intertwine, and you know, have that kind of shock moments as well, where you're kind of you've just been in quite a serious sequence, uh, and then suddenly you get a, a cowboy walks on. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're kind of like, okay, cool, yeah, we got a cowboy. I, I, I'm up for this. Um, so it was it was really fun to be honest. I mean, it's it's difficult. You know, you really. That's when Natasha and, and, and Chris did a great job with the edit um, and the music really helped as well. Uh, and the same with the production design and the costume, you know, all that kind of stuff um, that kind of uh, merged it all together. And Pat Aldinger's um, cinematography as well, you know, that giving it that that um, that look that follows all the way through. Even when we're in the police station and it's a bit more naturalised, it's still got that neon kind of slightly Blade Runner kind of yeah. esque feel to it. So you needed all of these things, all of these HODs in their departments to bring that all together along with the cast for the the script to be able to work in that way. We shot on Harold for the first week for the interrogation, walking on the set with Kate. It was very, I don't know, there was a green hue and these three great German team of guys led by Pat. It was wonderful guys. You're like, these guys are different. They had their own sort of thing and it felt like graphic novel, otherworldly, mm. sort of Eastern European, sort of Ger- Germanesque. Um, and then with the decrepit sort of locations with a little neon hue, there was a Blade Runner feel and how that integrated with Cynthia's costume choices. But then there's the, the first week was very serious and very intense with Kate. And then all of a sudden we're in the hallways and we, you know, we know what, what, what happens then, you know, we know what we see, but there's a thing, there's an undercurrent with this movie that, you know, James, I don't think, I don't think you get enough credit for it. It's James is McCready. He's the everyman. He's really relatable in the script, you know, with his story with his wife that's going through it. And like, you know, how, how good he is as McCready, how natural he is when he's not, off the lines when he's getting out of the elevators when he's he you know he is he is so good as McCready that there's it's it's relatable there's all these different things the seriousness of heritage the hyper real comedy but then McCready's through line yeah I love how they mesh together the fact of the matter is the the punches and the kicks and everything are fantastic and they don't really for, for me uh, as as a viewer it might not have landed as well in those scenes the the hyper real bits without the interrogation stuff the interrogation stuff is is just insanely good and your monologue and alongside kate dickey is just incredible and you have a very natural chemistry with her on screen that just floats across and uh-huh. i i had the chance to to meet kate about six years ago at a comic-con and, and i got like five minutes to talk with her literally my first ever interview for the podcast absolutely bricking it had a couple of pints at the bar before i went and spoke to her and (laughs) within about two seconds it was like i was just talking to to an old friend really she's just that way inclined amazing Uh, yeah what was it like working alongside her and and monologuing the life out of each other incredible incredible i couldn't ask for more i i I can't say enough good things. Loved her. You know, it, 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 was, it was tough going in straight in for this 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 long week and a half or week of interrogation. And she was just, I couldn't ask for more. The movie would be so different had it not been for doing that week with, with Kate because she gives so much. And in a way, both of the characters 
Kate's character, Keaton, you know, is trying to reveal Brody for who he is and vice versa. But Kate being Kate, because as you say, within two seconds of talking to her, you're like, I know this person my whole life. So that added energy feels like a comfort blanket where she's actually feels like she's cradling you. And that to me, her, it's, it's just, she's just beautiful. She's wonderful. You know, she's, she's amazing. It, it grounded it for me. No matter what happened after that, that week in the fight scenes and everything that happened in flashbacks and all that, I, I wanted to respect what, what me and Kate had done because she was just so giving as an actor. I love her to bits. Every, everything you said and more. She's amazing. Amazing. I think as well, the, the moment for me, and, and I'm sure James, I've, I've been on film sets where I've seen things happen and you see a director looking at like his DOP and be like, oh man, we, we've got some fucking gold here. But the scene where Mo sort of, without spoilers, breaks down on Kate, after they've kind of been loggerheads against each other and, and you kind of break down against a, a shoulder and I'm just sitting there thinking, oh, this is just, you know what I mean? Two minutes ago, somebody slapping someone with a dildo and now you've got me feeling something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that, that, uh, that uh, it was such an interesting journey for, uh, for the two characters and like quite easily it could have been, uh, which is the opposite of what I wanted again, is two people sat in a room um, you know, it's kind of Criminal Minds kind of TV procedural yeah. where we interview and so on and so forth. What I really wanted was a complete journey for the two characters. And um, uh, you probably noticed it, but what they actually end up doing is, you know, they end up moving right around the room during this interview and then swapping seats. Yeah. So by the end of it, he's in the position of uh, where she originally was doing the interrogation and then she's on the opposite side. And so you have this physical uh, and... Um, uh, uh, physical journey for them uh, as well as the character development um, and they were just fantastic I mean that scene as well I mean every everything we shot <laughs> the editor kept saying like oh is this two days worth of stuff that she got and they were like no no it's one day it's one day's worth of stuff um, because the film is massive I mean what we shot we shot it in five weeks um, and it is a huge huge film uh, for, for what budget we had and, and how long we had and so these scenes where they were, you know, they were going quick and I don't like to shoot too much anyway. So we did, you know, two to three takes uh, on each thing. Um, and I think we originally shot that scene in a, in a one -er. no. Um So I shot two one and that's what we cut together is two one and that was it. Um, and that was just fantastic because you suddenly went from this very cool kind of icy interrogation to this moment that again, I've, I've personally not seen in a, in a film. Uh, with the interrogation so again it was that thing of how do I develop this to a point that maybe I haven't seen this on screen before and it'd be something that is new in something that is a tried and tested uh, you know the police interrogation with the criminal uh, sequence uh, so that was kind of the idea it was very surprising it was very surprising Kev when I because you assume interrogation is two shots you know yeah. over the table for the whole time but James is like, no, 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 we're going to get you up. And by the end of this, you're going to be like two children sitting against the wall. And we felt like two kids sitting against the wall having cans, me and Kate. I was like, this is great crack, isn't it? What's my life? No, this is great crack, you know? Um, the film's out there, but I couldn't get two cans in the, in the scene. It just didn't. <laughs> That's right. The dildos was far enough. I couldn't get them. you know, stupid special bruise or something. This is the serious part of the movie. We can't quite do that. <laughs> it's just, I, I, I love that scene. I, lo I love just everything you guys are doing on there. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take up overly too much more of your time. I, you've been very, very, very um, gracious with your time tonight. Uh, the movie does come out tomorrow. So, um, well, by the time this goes out, it'll be out. But the movie does come out on Friday the 11th, which is also Mo's birthday, I believe. So happy right. birthday, Mo. Thank you very much. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll be another year older by the time we get to this interview. But um, I'm still 32. This year doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so I'm still this... in that cell, sitting down. Having two cans. I'm so, still waiting for those two cans. <laughs> you, you guys filmed this in five weeks you you had the the script in the movie you were you were pushing around for a good five years you've had the idea for a good 10 years how does it feel now for you guys that the film is out there for people to see and receive it the way they are 
Um, for me, it feels uh, it feels fantastic. I mean, it's a huge weight off, uh, and I feel like I can move forward with a new project and be really excited because Knuckle Dust has just always been there for such a long time, and you know, trying to get it through, and then you know, trying to get it finished, and you know, the COVID hit, and suddenly nothing was as I expected it to be. Um, so it's really good. I mean, all the reactions are so varied, and you know, different people pick up on different things that they like and or don't like, and and all of it is good, I'll be honest. You know, you, you just kind of like, I made the film to to push buttons as well. I didn't want to make a very yeah. safe film. I really wanted to go for it and, and, and go, do you know what, what What can we do here that I haven't seen before? Or, you know, what what can I throw at this where you kind of go, this doesn't, you know, people don't usually mix these two things. And I'm kind of like, let's, let's fucking try it. Let's fucking get it on screen and see what happens, you know? Um, so I feel really good about it. So, you know, my, my fiance is looking forward to me not talking about knuckle dust anymore. <laughs> um, so, so that's good. Um, but yeah, it's just been a, you know, it's a pleasure and a joy, you know, for, forever now. Uh, you know, I'm attached to Mo and Kate and, and Jamie and Phil and uh, all these wonderful human beings in this film. Um, and I'm really hoping, you know, it's, if anything, it's the film that people say, you have to watch it for the dildo fight. <laughs> I'm good with that. If that's on my tombstone, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Great <laughs> husband, great father, great son. You have to watch it for the dildo fight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Mo, how was it for you uh, getting this film out there and Great. and showing Great. everyone your chops? Great. I'm delighted with the man. I, I I love getting it out there. I mean. What people tend to forget is how, how much how much effort goes into making a movie like this and how many sleepless nights and the work that James has put in, the years that James has put in, you know, and, and Lucy, his fiance, also worked on this in 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 in, in, in hair and makeup and, and was on board and people forget the, the joy which can come from just doing it. What I learned from Sebastian, I'm so glad I listened to him. It's about now, and it's about the characters you meet. And it's about putting a smile on someone's face that you go, you know what, we're in a pandemic. We just want to see a fight scene. Or we just want to we just want to enjoy that moment of sign language or or a laugh. We just want that because that's what we need right now. And yes. and that journey of going on that journey with people who are essentially filming a, a 10 week shoot in a five week shoot. And you've got people giddy, you know, you've got references to point break. You've got the armor of steam going. Mike, mate, you just did point break there. I'm like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. We don't have time. Just carry on, continue. Keep going. You know, and that that last few moments you have in the day to try and make this, I I love it. I love the journey. I love watching James. I, from, I love watching James from afar. That sounds very strange. <laughs> I like watching James going from McCready to his directing thing, going from McCready and putting on his cans. He's like fucking Stallone. He's like, he knows exactly what he has to do. And then he's so focused. He does his ease to it. He gives you two takes and he's so patient. And it's made, it's my idea of collaboration, making movies, working with this man. We all love him. We couldn't ask for a better director as an actor. I, I love the process and I hope people enjoy it. Awesome, awesome. And uh, a little while back, uh, Mo, you mentioned about uh, the world building that's going on in this. I, I wouldn't be a very good interviewer or a very good film fan if I didn't ask this next question. There is a very rich, rich world here. There are some very rich characters. Are we going to see a Knuckle Dust 2? Are you working on one or is it just like it's out there? Let's let it breathe. Uh, for the moment, it's uh, have to see how it does, I guess, you know. Um, it's been nice. A few people have asked, which is really good. Um, but th there are, it, it's been planned for a while, you know, the, the entire world and, and how a trilogy would work. Um, you know, a really kind of grindhouse, kind of uh, street level, kind of gritty kind of little trilogy, a little British trilogy, you know. And um so yeah, there's there's ideas there, and uh, I, I pitched a few to Mo. Uh, he seems to quite like them. Um, I think one of the other things we we're looking at is you know maybe doing some um, graphic novels, nice um, based on the characters and stuff. And uh, there's so many good characters in there, and you know some of them we only meet for a short period of time. I mean, uh, I think the backstory of TikTok is fascinating. Um, I mean, obviously I wrote it; it's hilarious and brilliant, um, but. I think it, it would be fascinating to see where they came from uh, and where they're going. And I, I think that would be the dream is to carry it on. Um, I know I'd love to get back on a set with Mo and, and then Kate and, and people like that. Um, 
we just have to see how it does really i guess so certain someone you know without any spoilers got in the lift so yes yes oh we haven't even talked about chris uh yeah, yeah. So let's talk about chris quickly yeah <laughs> chris is unbelievable, unbelievable. He's yeah, what a- so good. And um, I met Chris, uh, I did, uh, as an actor, I did a show called Of Mice and Men, the John Steinbeck, uh, based on the John Steinbeck book. And I played George in that. And he played um, Curly, which is a very angry, funny, little uh, American man. Mm-hmm. And I, I started working on uh, Not Now Nigel. And I thought, how do I get a very funny, angry, little Irish man? And then I thought, Chris, uh, yeah, this is perfect. And if you've ever watched the football with Chris, it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. It's like pure Nigel. So I wrote this part towards Chris. It's, it, he's fantastic in it. He gets so vexed and he screams at the, the, the screen uh, and, and just shouts at players who obviously can't hear him. And, and then he sits down with his beer and, he, and then he's just like, ah, well, you know, it, it is what it is. And then you just kind of like, yeah, I could write a part for that. Um, he's so he's so funny in this, um, and so the warm. amazing things is he kind of he's a really dark character. Like he cuts bodies up, <laughs> yeah. and um, yeah. and then Jeremiah, his his boss, is a real piece of shit. <laughs> and at the end, we found that a lot of people do really feel for them, and that you have like a lot of kind of like, oh no, but I, I quite like them, even though he's obviously chopping up bodies and he's he's a real piece of shit. Uh, but, you know, I quite like these guys, which I think is testament to Gethin and Chris and the way they portray the characters um, and, and really give them a lot of heart and life. On um, on Gethin really quickly, um, did you ever discuss with him where this character came from? Because this is such a... It's, <laughs> I keep talking about you taking characters from, like, other worlds and plopping them in this movie. He's such a random character to be in this <laughs> film. <laughs> but... It, but he works. He works so well, especially with Not Now Nigel. The two of their performances together are just unbelievably brilliant. But it's like you've taken this guy who's just so 80s yes. and just slammed him into this film. And <laughs> I'm just sitting there thinking, what is he channeling here? What is he? But I loved it. I loved it. it cool. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I, just, I wanted a henchman from. I wanted a great henchman, and all the great henchmen are from the 80s. Yeah. You know, um, Ao Long in, uh, in Die Hard, uh, when he goes for the candy bar, you know, um, Ao Long in um, Big Trouble in Little China. Um, you know, all these cool henchmen, you know, the Bond films of, uh, like, Jaws in, in, Roger, in the Roger Moore ones, like, all these 80s henchmen. And I thought, I really want a cool 80s henchman. And I thought, well, let's just have an 80s henchman. That's yeah. fine. Um, and so, yeah, we went for the mullet and the mustache, um, <laughs> which I absolutely love him in. Um, again, his fiance was not too happy with the mustache, um, but it is what it is, bless her. Uh, she, she dealt with it for a few weeks, which was really lovely of her. Um, and then Cynthia's costumes for him were unbelievable because I gave everyone kind of reference books of what I wanted to look like. And I had pictures of, you know, Don Johnson in Miami Vice. And, oh, yeah, big um, time. Tom Selleck in uh, Magnum PI and stuff like that. And she went to town on him. I think he looks fantastic. So, yeah, he's just basically an 80s henchman from Die Hard or Miami Vice, and I've just put him in this film. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And we talked about Jamie a little while back. Um, she has quite possibly one of my favourite arcs in the whole movie because what you think is going on with her character ends up being the best joke of the film. Just... <laughs> I was just when that happens towards the end, I was just like, oh, "What?" <laughs> yeah, she's I, she's fantastic. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't think she's ever played a copper before, um, so it's super interesting for her. Um, I don't think she's ever done that, and so she was a real badass. And um, when we looked at costume with her, you know, she's in like quite high heeled boots. Um, she looks like epically cool. Um, and super badass and also she's like a I think she's a sergeant in the film and I'm a detective but she absolutely runs me uh, ragged like she is obviously in charge uh, and it's kind of like but I'm actually a detective okay no yeah fine Jamie you, you, you just tell me what to do and funny <laughs> enough, the, the scene outside of the um of the club when they first storm the club and she's like where's where's the, oh, fuck the ramp, ramp? Uh, and he's like I didn't bring the ramp that was originally McCready up until we shot that in week four. So up until week three, that was McCready doing that scene. 
Um, but I just thought Dame, Jamie was so good and so fantastic and so badass um, that I was just like, do you want to take this scene? And I'll just rewrite it a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, I just rewrote it and gave it to Jamie and she absolutely smashes it. It's, it's, she's amazing in the film. It's such a real privilege to work with her because I think she is... I think she's a respected actress, but I think she's really underrated. And, yeah. um, you know, she should be doing so much more. I, I, I think she's brilliant. It was a real, yeah, just a real privilege to have her on set. She, again, she has good, positive vibes. I was very lucky with that with the cast. Great, great to be around. With that, you she's know? great to be around. Yeah, yeah she's awesome. Yeah. It's a, awesome. Just a good-hearted human being. So yeah. it's really tough to have her. And, uh, yeah, I mean, she's, she's, I find her to be quite iconically British. Yeah, uh, for me, you know, but you, you get Jamie Winston, you're like, yeah, yeah, you get a bit of Jamie Winston. I'm, I'm up for the bit of Jamie Winston. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a badass. Let's have a kicking in a, a, a door to an underground fight club. Yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. This is badass. So yeah, you do, she was fantastic. You do, you do totally like because she's not exactly the tallest girl in the world, but you totally buy that this character would be telling this whole squad of men. Just get that fucking door open now. Yeah. <laughs> you, she's and great. Being kind of like exasperated at the fact that where it's just kind of like, for yeah. sake, is, this is all day. Um, <laughs> and then what was really interesting was we didn't do the kind of like where the women are kind of all one group and the men are all mm. another group. What we kind of worked with Kate and Jamie was kind of like, uh, no, Jamie wants Kate's job. Like, you know, Redmond wants Keaton's job. Jamie doesn't, you know, Jamie's character doesn't give a fuck like she's not there she's there to get what she needs to get so it's, it's a really strong part of her where she just kind of pretty much un unrelenting but really intelligent and she plays it really well so guys what we're gonna do now is uh we're I'm, uh, we've pretty much done it all the way through this but um i would like what both of you guys uh take it in turns if you want to tell people out there why they should see knuckle dust and what they're gonna get out of it go for it mo if you want a good laugh over the lockdown and with a few surprises and get reminded of the movies you grew up with, with, with uh, something for everybody by a great director, check out Knuckle Dust. Yeah, I think that's it, really. You know, it's been a tough year and it's, it doesn't take itself too seriously. There are laughs in it if you want to laugh. There's a nice serious streak if you want to get a bit serious. There's mental fights. Um, it will take your mind off the world for a couple of hours and also uh yeah there's dildo fights in it with dildo nunchucks <laughs> I mean, um yeah if you like dildos or you like nunchucks imagine those two together this is your film <laughs> i feel like you should be mass marketing them now and, and just get you know <laughs> knuckle dust merchandise <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, if, uh, we'll put them on Etsy. The sun lads are dying to go again. They're dying to get those masks on again. <laughs> Bring them all back. Bring the cast back. Bring them all back. <laughs> So this this is um this has been an absolute pleasure, guys. I'm so I'm so glad we did this. Um, I kind of stopped reviewing a little while back. I think it was it was round about the the first lockdown. Just didn't. Much like everyone else, I just didn't really have it in me at that point, and I was just like, I'm, I'm not really into to reviewing right now. I was still doing the podcast and the interviews, but the reviewings were stopping. And then I started getting back into it again. I was like, I need to get back on this train and and get myself creatively moving again. And Knuckle Dust was probably like one of the the first five movies that I watched when I started getting back into it. But it was the first one that I just connected with, and just it, like I've said before. It hit every bone in my body and, and just the references, the music, the, the Kung Fu, the punchy kicky, the dialogue, everyone in it is, you know, we've said a couple of people are criminally underrated actors. I, I genuinely believe everyone in this is, you know, underrated as fuck, really. And and I want to see every one of them go on and, and smash it. And I think you're all going to do brilliant and, and give me a knuckle dust too. Well, if it, it re-releases in a couple of years, I look forward to seeing underrated as fuck. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking bad. I'll take that. <laughs> I, it's so funny because I, I write my reviews and then sometimes people pick up on quotes and, and they get put on the posters. They always pick the shit ones, though. <laughs> they never pick, like, this movie is Cynthia's balls. Like, they don't go for that. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, it was a good movie with some good acting. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why I'm here. <laughs>
<laughs> but honestly, Perfect. guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, thanks, for, you, man. thanks for the support, man. Thank you. Yes. We appreciate it. Yeah, well, I'll I'll keep the uh, movie comes out tomorrow comes out um Friday the 11th and I'll I'll be pushing it as much as possible. Um, I believe over on Nerdly UK which is the website that I'm doing the podcast for they're doing a competition right now to to give away some digital copies. So um please do if if you're watching this or listening this it'll be on for another week after this goes out. Get on there you get yourself a free copy of the movie so awesome. Maybe if you win I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't promise you'll get one, but you might. <laughs> but if you don't, buy it anyway. Get it on there. I'm assuming it's going to be on all the, the streaming sites, the digital VOD, Apple, Sky, all those things. All uh, yeah, on. Amazon, iTunes, Virgin, um, PlayStation, Xbox, and I'm quite sure a couple of others. Awesome, awesome. And please do check it out. For, for me, I've said it to Mo before, and he's a very humble man, but... This for me is the the lead performance of 2020, and, okay. and I'm genuinely genuinely mean that it's the only one where I've sat and your commitment to this role is fantastic because it could easily be a bonkers just you know and and you commit to it so well and you're a, you're a legend. I'm feeding off the energy around me. Thanks so much. Awesome, awesome. Genuinely feeding off everyone around me. You're you're awesome. And James, I will be keeping an eye to see what your next writing job or directing job. I can't wait to see what you've got coming up and keep me posted, man. But yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be watching anyway. Yeah. I'll cool, man. So with that, we are going to go out and uh, again, check out the movie. Please do check out these guys. Everything's awesome. Uh, all the social medias and everything. They're posting posters all the time, behind the scenes all the time. Just please check out everything because Knuckle Dust needs to be seen. Thank you. God bless. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. That's me, Millie. Ordinary, boring Millie. I love your dress. I think I saw it at Discount Bonanza. <laughs> okay, so I was never the most popular. Homecoming's this weekend. Booker is going to be at the dance. And boys never really noticed me. Wow! Ah! <laughs> Honestly, if this was a horror movie... I'd be one of the first ones to get killed. Cue the creepy dude in the mask. If you listened to the last episode, um, I had a nerdly contributor on the show with me. It was Jason Brigger from the History of Bad Ideas. Do go and check out their podcast. They're absolutely awesome. We love History of Bad Ideas. Please check them out. So, um... He has done a review on the website of a movie that I have actually seen, so I can input into this. The movie is called Freaky. It's sort of like um, Freaky Friday, Jamie Lee Curtis, Lindsay Lohan, all those kind of films where they switch bodies, and yeah, with a bit of a twist. So um, yeah, Jason Brigger came at the website with Freaky. Uh, stars Vince Vaughn, Catherine Newton, Celeste O'Connor, Misha... Mm, Osharovich, I'm terrible with him. Uh, written by Michael Kennedy and Christopher Landon, directed by Christopher Landon. So let's get into this. Freaky. <laughs> Freaky is one of the few major motion pictures that has been released in the last few months of this year, at least in the United States, and is a fun mix of Freaky Friday and Mean Girls with a dash of the Scream franchise. Vince Vaughn looks like he is having fun playing not only a serial killer but also a 17 year old high schooler while the rest of the cast including Misha Oshevich in a breakout role does a solid job creating a fun and unique film Freaky takes a cliche of two completely different types of characters and have them swap bodies in this case the two characters Millie, Catherine Newton a shy high school teenager and the butcher Vince Vaughn a serial killer that is terrorising the town of Blissfield magically switch bodies when the serial killer stabs Millie with an ancient mystical dagger Millie must not only convince her two friends Josh Detmer Misha Misho Osherovich and Nyla Celeste O'Connor she isn't the butcher, but also recruit them to help her stop the real serial killer while also getting her own body back within 24 hours, or the curse will never be lifted. Along the way, the body count rises, not as much as you would think, and a sweet backstory evolves between Millie and her mother, Kate Finneran, and sister Dana Drury. That is not often found in most horror films. Yeah, I'm... Um, 
the, it does take the old cliche, but it does put a new spin on it. And then um, Blumhouse, um, this is a Blumhouse movie. Don't think I don't see what you're doing here. Like the last few movies that these guys have been putting out. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of Blumhouse. Blumhouse, they they put out some great like little horror movies and everything like that. But they kind of just take um, a story cliche that's been done to death and just put a horror slant on it. That's all they really do. These movies. Um, while they are great, they're not exactly the most original. It's pretty obvious what's going on, but it's working for them. So I'm perfectly happy to let them do it. So yeah, I'll just go with that. So Jason does this thing where he does the good, the bad, and the middling, which I quite like. Um, you know, it, it does what it says on the tin. He gives the good points, the bad points, the middling points. So the good... Misho Osherovich. Uh, as mentioned above, Osherovich's role as Josh Detmer, one of Millie's best friends, steals the film. And I, I actually agree with that. Not only does Josh have some of the funniest lines, but he also plays the role of Randy from the Scream franchise by pointing out common sense logic that is usually absent in horror movies. Another po positive is the character, and for that matter... Another positive is the character. And for that matter, Millie and Nyla are portrayed as genuine people and their reactions, responses never seem forced in the film. The audience will grow to like these characters and will root for them to overcome not only the butcher, but also the hazards of high school. Despite Newton and O'Connor's strong acting, Osherovich is the breakout role of the film and leaves the audience wanting to see more of this budding star. My only thing about the high school was like, it's, it's sort of like a high school teen horror. You don't really spend much time in the high school and you don't really, like... They seem to be a group of kind of ostracized characters and you don't really know why. Like, I guess it's a horror movie, so you don't have all the time in the world to start throwing out backstory or whatnot, but a little bit would have been okay. So uh, another good point is a twist on a classic modern. Writer-director Christopher Landon has, I keep wanting to say Landon, has experience in turning a horror trope on its side, as seen in his previous film, Happy Death Day. So... Talking, taking another film, no, so taking another old film trope, body swapping and successfully making a fun and quirky film in Freaky should not surprise anyone. Landon keeps the pace of the film moving, never allowing the momentum of the plot to slow down and ca causing the one, one hour and 42 minutes fly by. The writers also do a phenomenal job of producing a secondary storyline as Millie and her family deal with the off-screen death of her father, which the writers not only allow the storyline to grow organically, but they also give it a sense of closure. Most horror films introduce a secondary storyline, but the story usually never goes anywhere or is forgotten. But not in Freaky. On top of that, the deceased father storyline actually plays into why Millie, her sister and her mother act the way they do with not only each other, but in the extreme situations they are placed in. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to get... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to let that one go. I'm, I'm, I'm all right with that, yeah. I just... Um, right, I don't want to do spoilers. I'm not going to do spoilers. But I feel like this movie could have ended, like, a good ten minutes before it actually does end. And it kind of annoyed me what they did at the end. Um, other than that, I completely agree with the family storyline. The bad. <clears throat> Lack of backstory for Millie's High School. Oh, Jason, Jason, we are on the same page. I know exactly what you're going to do. So while the film does a tremendous job of giving backstory to Millie's family, her backstory about her position in the high school hierarchy seems unfinished. Completely agree. Millie and her friends are seen as nerds, outcasts, but we never really see the reason why they are picked on by the cool kids. Yes, Millie is quiet, much to her one teacher's chagrin. He loves seeing that. While Nyla is artsy and Josh is gay, but overall, we never really learn why they are the brunt of everyone's bullying. I know teenagers don't really need a reason to pick on others, but a little more information and possibly spending another 15 minutes in the high school environment would have helped. The small issue adding to the confusion is Booker. Uriah Shelton, one of the football players and cool kids who has a crush on Millie. There isn't much of a reason to understand why they like each other, and for being a group of outcasts, Millie and her friends are pretty much welcomed to any party or event that, in general, non cool kids are not usually welcome to. Yeah, 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 totally with you. Um, the, the only other thing about that, though, is 
and and I did kind of think this when I was saying about the um the whole like high school kind of hierarchy and everything like that is the the fact that you got to get some Vince Vaughn in there. Vince Vaughn's got to be doing his thing, and Vince Vaughn is doing his thing. By the way, he's not really mentioned that yet. This is probably the the best Vince Vaughn performance I have seen in in years. He is loving this role and he's playing it very well and just going for it. So yeah, we'll stick with that. So the middling. So this is like the the not not overly great, but also not overly bad um, part of the movie for him. Where's the body count? The opening scene of the film starts with promise, as the butcher, known in the beginning of the film as more of an urban legend than real, slashing his way through several teenagers at a small gathering while one of the teenagers' parents are away. The scene plays out like a typical horror film and allows for several unique kills by the butcher while establishing just how deranged the killer is. Unfortunately, minus the two murders when the butcher first enters Millie's body, the body count takes a break until the end. The lack of a body count in the middle of the film doesn't hamper it, but it did surprise me that a slasher film, the body count wasn't much higher. Luckily, Freaky remedies this issue by the end of the film, as several bullies get their penance at the hands of the butcher, and we are left with a satisfying and brutal ending. I totally get what he's saying there about about the body count it, it does kind of slow the pace down it does kind of like stop to to breathe and to let you get to know the characters i guess that's that's just the thing um we need to get to know them before they die kind of thing or or maybe die so yeah it's it's very middling i'll give them that it is just like a eh. so um final grade gets a b minus which apparently is a good uh, Freaky just misses out on being a future classic horror film but it's still a great way to spend the night at home during a pandemic the cast is top notch the murders are unique but not in a completely unrealistic way and the horror the humour hits when it needs to hit overall Freaky does a good job of mashing the film's mean girls into the world of Scream and giving a unique take on a tired trope of body swapping if you're looking for a fun smart and different horror film Freaky is well worth your time yeah, I absolutely agree with that. They do, like I, like I said before, Blumhouse has taken these tropes and they they just put a horror slant on it and they do keep working. But I do completely agree with what Jason's saying about it just missing out on being a, a future classic because these movies, I feel these um, genre swapping kind of crossovers, which I do generally tend to love. I mean, Knuckle Dust is the big one of them. They just sometimes, especially these Blumhouse ones, they don't come across as in about 20 years we're going to be talking about them. They are not the new Friday the 13th. They are not the new Halloweens. They are just freaky. They just are what they are. So yeah, that's fine. You can catch Jason on the Geek-Centric podcast, The History of Bad Ideas, as new episodes are released every week at nerdly.co.uk or subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Amazon Music and other podcasting apps. That is awesome. Please do that. We love them. So yeah, that's um, that's this episode. This is your new episode of Nerdly Out Loud. That is uh, two awesome reviews, uh, Freaky and Knuckle Dust. You got to hear a fantastic featured interview. We are going to keep this train rolling. The Skyline Q&A will be going on to the podcast as well. Um, maybe the next episode, I'm not sure. We also have the Dimitri Logothetis interview coming shortly. He is the director of Jiu Jitsu. That was absolutely amazing. The, you know, the Nicolas Cage bonkers uh, ninjas kicking ass against aliens with Nicolas Cage in the middle of it. We did that interview with Dimitri. That was an awesome interview. We loved him. But yeah, keep listening to Nerdly Out Loud. We are not going anywhere. I have big plans for the YouTube channel. Keep watching the videos, keep listening to the pod, keep coming back, because as we like to say, we are nerdly. Are you? <laughs>